Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining me. My name is Kelly Papish. I'm a nurse practitioner at the Cleveland Clinic Lou Ruvo Center for Brain Health in Las Vegas. And today I'm going to be talking about Parkinson's plus syndromes and secondary Parkinsonism. So Parkinsonism is a term that's used to describe symptoms that are found in Parkinson's disease, such as bradykinesia, resting tremor, rigidity, or postural instability. And these terms make up Parkinsonism. The most common form of Parkinsonism is idiopathic Parkinson's disease. But 15% of these cases can be an atypical form of Parkinsonism. So again, the Parkinsonism umbrella, it makes up any of the symptoms that may fall under Parkinson's disease, which we're most familiar with. Idiopathic Parkinson's disease being the most common. And then the atypical or Parkinson's plus syndromes that include dementia with Lewy bodies, multiple system atrophy, progressive supranuclear palsy, or cortical basal degeneration. We also have secondary Parkinsonism, which could be drug-induced Parkinson's or vascular Parkinsonism, mm -hmm. among others, such as functional Parkinsonism. Atypical or Parkinson's plus syndromes refer to a set of symptoms that are very similar to Parkinson's disease, but they're caused by different disorders. And they differ in the progression of disease, um, the onset of symptoms, and the pathology. They also are much more difficult to diagnose than Parkinson's disease, and they can be more difficult to treat than Parkinson's disease. So unfortunately, misdiagnoses of atypical Parkinsonism are very common. I like this image. It just, um, it's alphabet soup. It just shows us with the atypicals or the Parkinson's plus syndromes. It's an easy way to remember they're all acronyms. We have MSA, DLB, PSP, or CBD. Um, and these make up the atypical or Parkinson's plus syndromes. So we'll start with one, um, multiple system atrophy. This is, as, as seen in Parkinson's disease um, and Lewy body dementia, MSA is a um, disorder caused by um, clumps of protein called alpha-synuclein, and it is it mimics Parkinson's disease. So you can see the same motor symptoms, stiffness, tremor, slowness of movement. However, it also involves a faster progression than Parkinson's disease, among other symptoms. The onset is typically around mid-50s, although it can occur later, and it does have a rapid progression. Usually what we see with MSA is that one or more body system is deteriorating at the same time. We see autonomic dysfunction early on in disease. In fact, often an early presenting symptom is dizziness, lightheadedness, or even syncopal episodes from falling from um, blood pressure or orthostasis, uh, orthostatic changes. We can also see uncontrolled emotions like pseudobulbar affect. Um, in coordination, clumsiness, changes to sleep patterns and, and mood, um, as well as cognitive changes. There are two major subtypes of MSA, including MSAP, which is a Parkinsonian subtype, and MSAC, which has more cerebellar involvement. Both of these um, subtypes can present similarly, although with the MSAC, we tend to see more imbalance, uh, more dis or in coordination, whereas the MSAP really, it, it, the Parkinsonism uh, features really dominate tremor, stiffness, slowness, again, leading to a lot of misdiagnoses. The treatment is really aimed at alleviating symptoms. We don't always see a great robust response from levodopa therapy. However, it can be tried. Um, on imaging, you can see here that we often will see um, the hot cross bun sign that's just something that's supportive in coming up with a diagnosis for MSA. And usually you can see that in the pons of the brain um, as it demonstrated here on imaging. With the next slide, we'll talk about dementia with Lewy bodies. Again, similar to MSA, this is a synucleinopathy, so protein um, clumps of alpha synucleum that um, is caused with the pathology. And it um, very much mimics Parkinson's disease. In fact, it's strikingly similar in a lot of features and it's often misdiagnosed. We tend to see cognitive or behavioral changes early on 
In fact, part of the diagnostic criteria is that the cognitive symptoms started at least one year earlier than the motor symptoms. This timeline can get really challenging because not everybody notices that they're having cognitive changes early until they look back. In hindsight, looking back, I did start to have some confusion or there were some changes to cognition prior to the motor movement. Therefore, diagnosis can take some time because the clinician might be trying to differentiate when did this really first occur. So we see Lewy body dementia, we see Parkinson's disease with dementia, and those look nearly identical. There's a couple things that set them apart. Again, the timeline. So when did the motor symptoms and the cognitive symptoms begin? And also the levodopa response. There's very poor response to levodopa in Lewy body uh, dementia. One uh, cardinal feature of this disease is fluctuations in cognition. Some days are great, the next day not so great. And also hallucinations um, will come with dementia with the Lewy body. On the next slide, you'll see, we'll talk about progressive supranuclear palsy. This is one of the most common atypical Parkinsonisms. It is um, a tauopathy, so it's um, the pathology behind it is due to abnormal accumulation of uh, protein of tau, um, is similarly to um, CBD and Alzheimer's disease. The main onset is early 60s, but it can occur later. And this again is a rapid progression. Some of the uh, main features that we see with PSP include early falls, specifically falls backwards, um, and limitations in eye movement. Mostly there's limitations in the vertical eye movement, although it can be in any direction. We see slowing of the saccades, slowing of the movement. Um, dysarthria changes to speech can occur early. We see impaired cognition, sleep changes, and some of the features that we see clinically in the presentation of the patient might be the Procera sign. And that is like a, a particularly worried facial expression. And you can see that demonstrated here in the, in the image. This is a clinical diagnosis, same as all of the other Parkinsonisms. Um, however, some of the imaging can be supportive. For example, on the MRI, we might see a poss possible hummingbird sign. And that um, you can see demonstrated here in the midbrain. The treatment usually involves higher doses of levodopa. So these patients do tend to respond to levodopa um, better than some of the other atypicals, but it may require higher doses. Also supportive therapy like rehabilitation to make sure we're watching for falls and swallowing challenges and keeping the patient safe. And the next slide, we'll talk about cortical basal degeneration. This is the least common type of atypical Parkinsonism. And again, it's a tauopathy. The typical onset is around age 60. Um, one of the striking features, though, is that it usually is unilateral in initial presentation. So we'll see one side of the body, one limb that's affected. We can see myoclonus or um, dystonia or praxia of one side or one limb, but we can also see what's called an alien limb phenomenon. And it's really where one arm or one limb is moving in, involuntarily from the body. We see a typ typically a rapid progression with CBD. And the uh, clinical, the diagnosis is a clinical, you know, based on symptoms, history, presentation, and it also has a poor response to Parkinson's medications. Um, on the imaging, what we can see is a significant asymmetry. And you can see that here, um, especially in the cortical atrophy, and that's where we would um, have some support when looking at diagnosing CBD. The treatment really is aimed at cognitive and behavioral um, and symptom management. So let's talk about secondary Parkinsonism. So we have the atypical Parkinson's and then we have secondary Parkinsonism. And these are a group of disorders that mimic Parkinson's disease, but they have a different etiology. So one of the most commonly known is drug-induced Parkinsonism. There's also vascular Parkinsonism, others like normal pressure hydrocephalus, um, even traumatic or repetitive head injuries. 
And sometimes there's hormone imbalances that can mimic um, Parkinsonism and contribute to tremor. And then there's also functional movement disorders or functional Parkinson's disease. So we'll begin with the drug-induced Parkinsonism. This is the most common type of secondary Parkinsonism. It occurs after a long-term exposure to a neuroleptic medication. And it, the, side, the side effects of some of those medications that have been used long-term can contribute to Parkinson features such as tremor, slowness. Uh, many drugs that, uh, these are mainly drugs that affect the, the dopamine in the brain or the dopamine levels. And that would be uh, most commonly like antipsychotics, some antidepressants and some um, antiemetics. So what we find in clinical presentation is often a more mild presentation of Parkinsonism. One thing that we also might notice is that it's not really progressing as quickly. Usually after stopping these medications, we can find some benefit or relief of the Parkinson's symptoms, but not always. Um, and so treatment is really aimed at trying to take away the offending drug if possible, although some patients are unable to allow for that. Um, because the, tr the disease or the um, disorder that we're trying to treat with those medications maybe overwhelms them and is, is more important than treating the tremor. On the next slide, we're going to talk about vascular Parkinsonism. This is when small strokes, multiple stro small strokes can occur in the areas of the brain, specifically like the basal ganglia. Um, that can over time contribute to Parkinson's symptoms. The basal ganglia, ganglia is the area in the brain where it has the motor control. And so if there's damage or infarcts to that area, we can tend to see Parkinson's features come out. It usually is diagnosed um, by a severe onset of these symptoms immediately following a stroke. That's the easiest way. And that's the most common um, way to easily detect that this is affiliated with the stroke. However, it can also occur from multiple small strokes over time, little small strokes that the patient doesn't even know is taking place. And that can be a little bit more difficult. Um, imaging though can help with that. Sometimes we can get imaging of the brain and it, we can see that there's some, um, there's vascular disease and that will help support the diagnosis of vascular Parkinsonism. And other signs that can indicate vascular Parkinsonism could be prominent early cognitive changes, um, lower body issues, especially gait and balance problems. And there's less often a resting tremor. We will often um, use the term or hear um, lower body Parkinsonism, and that's usually referring to a vascular Parkinsonism. The treatment is aimed at stroke prevention, cardiovascular health, safety prevention, rehabilitation. They, they, the patients with vascular Parkinsonism may find some benefit from levodopa therapy, although it's usually subpar or not as robust as we would see in Parkinson's disease. Another form of a secondary Parkinsonism could be um, normal pressure hydrocephalus. This is a condition that is caused by an abnormal buildup of CSF in the ventricles of the brain. When people have normal pressure uh, hydrocephalus, they have an excess of uh, CSF fluid. And because of this, their bodies cannot properly drain that or absorb the fluid. Therefore, it puts pressure on the ventricles, contributing to symptoms that can mimic Parkinson's disease. In, uh, NPH usually occurs in patients over 60. Um, the cardinal features are gait disturbance, urinary changes, and cognitive changes, such as dementia. So those three features together could help trigger a thought that this is NPH. Some of the things that you can do to work this up if you're um, suspecting that this NPH could be a, um, the diagnosis is looking at imaging. The MRI or other imaging might show the enlargement of the ventricles. And in that case, you can do some measurements um, known as the Evans ratio. And at that time, um, if you're finding that the, the um, enlargement of the ventricles meets criteria, you might do further workup. That would include a high volume lumbar puncture. High volume lumbar puncture is um, often done where a patient will have um, high volume, about 30 cc's of fluid at least taken off 
Um, and at that time, they would do a pre and post test. So they would be assessed uh, cognitively, gait, we'd watch and maybe even time their gait. And then we would take note of their urinary symptoms. They would have the high volume lumbar puncture and then come back and repeat those same assessments. Typically what we see is immediate improvement in gait. That's usually the first thing that we see improved with the high volume lumbar puncture. The other thing is cognition. And then maybe over the next couple of days, they'd see improvement in urinary function as well. So if we see a robust response from the high volume lumbar puncture, this patient may be a really good candidate to go in and get a permanent shunt placed. That way they will have continuous draining of the fluid and these symptoms can improve significantly. And then we have functional movement disorders. These are clinical syndromes defined by the presence of movements or involuntary movements that are incongruent or inconsistent um, with movement disorders that are known to be caused by a neur neurologic condition. The nervous system is intact, but the function is disordered. And we can see this in dystonia, tremor, gait impairment. We also can see um, Parkinson's, any Parkinsonism. This makes up about two to 4% of movement disorders. And the patient may have an organic disease, but they could have also have functional overlay. Um, this, the diagno diagnostic workup for this can be really challenging. Um, in fact, it can take several years or several different clinicians to see the same patient to really get the diagnosis down. And really it's because it's um, it, the, the presenting patient may mimic those Parkinsonian features really well in one visit where it looks, it looks, you know, like the, yep, we know what this is. This looks just like Parkinson's disease, but the next visit they come in, the symptoms might've changed. So we see an occurrence of characteristic clinical features that are consistent over time. We also see a decreased movement with distraction. And what that can mean is if we're assessing a patient and they have a tremor, a resting tremor, if we give them a task to distract them, we might notice a change in the resting tremor. Where if it's um, a truly Parkinson's, idiopathic Parkinson's disease, that tremor may stay consistent or worsen with distraction, a patient with a functional movement disorder, we might see that the tremor stops while the person, person is pausing to think, um, et cetera. Treatment really is highly aimed at multidisciplinary care, physical therapy, occupational therapy, most importantly, cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, even I think the Mayo Clinic has a program called Best Therapy that is aimed specifically at um, treating functional movement disorders. So just to kind of review some diagnostic pearls, it is vital to get a thorough patient history and the timing of onset of symptoms in patients with Parkinsonism. This helps guide our entire diagnostic journey. We can find some red flags along the way that may um, key, key us into looking at atypical or secondary forms of Parkinsonism. The red flags are really important, especially in looking at the atypical Parkinsonism. Oftentimes Parkinson's will be diagnosed as the initial diagnosis. And then in the next two to three years, we see it kind of veer off into an atypical form. So those initial years are really important to look at uh, progression of symptoms, how rapid that occurs, response to levodopa therapy, um, and how those symptoms change over time. We also um, can use imaging, PET, MRI, the DAT scan to help aid in supporting our diagnostic workup. So when you are diagnosing and you are seeing a, a patient whose symptoms maybe aren't perfectly aligned with Parkinson's disease, it's important to think of that Parkinsonism umbrella. Where do they fit? Is this Parkinson's disease? Is it a typical form? Is it secondary? Is it something else? And, and why are we looking to find out these? Uh, are, we, are we looking to find and follow through with red flags that we're seeing? And if, are we doing more work of at that point? You often are ruling out other etiologies to come up with a diagnosis, which makes this a really trying time for the clinician, 
as well as the patient and caregivers? This is a not always a straightforward answer that you, know, you have Parkinson's disease. In fact, um, it, it can be very challenging and very upsetting for patients going through this process because it can take multiple clinicians, it can take multiple visits and multiple trials, such as medication trials, before an accurate diagnosis is given. This is due to the fact that many of these atypical forms of Parkinson's mimic and present with similar features to Parkinson's disease. So in association with that, treatment also can be challenging. Sometimes you don't really understand as a clinician that this is an atypical form until we start to see that treatment isn't working and we start to question why that's not working. And then we have a better understanding that there's other factors that may be influencing this and we need to look at other diagnostic possibilities as well. I hope that this presentation was helpful and that you can take some of these pearls with you. I appreciate you joining me today. Thank you so much.